and let's get started. So welcome today to our discussion on pricing. And this actually was a follow-on to one of the first, oh, somebody's got some feedback going on. Is that me? Sorry about that. So this is a follow-on to some interesting, wow, sorry, Jim. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm having some technical problems. Today. I see, yeah. I'm going to mute you for a minute, dear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to mute Jim for a minute as he figures out his technical problems. Anyway, this particular topic on software pricing is a follow-on to the first webinar series we had, uh, webinar we had this, um, this year, uh, where we had... Um, uh, Peter Martin talking about the challenges of selling solutions within the industrial marketplace. And um, solutions is a touchy word for some of you who know me well. I think it's more a chemistry thing as opposed to a systems thing. But we know the word gets used in a lot of different ways. So anyway, the, the, the big questions that came up were um, the industrial markets tend not to value software as part of a solution as much as they do the hardware. How do we get over that hump, get the sales team, get the customers to realize there is as much value or actually probably more value in the software than in the hardware, which is rapidly trending towards commodity, as we all know, um, unfortunately. So Jim's going to talk about a lot of different ways of looking at the pricing picture with a focus on the software side. Um, let me just quick give you the quick overview. Um, this is presented to you by ISA and the ISA Marketing and Sales Summit. And the Marketing and Sales Summit is going to have its eighth annual conference this September uh, in New Orleans at the gorgeous W Hotel. Um, we will have a lot of interesting speakers like Jim Geisman. Um, I will probably be doing my search engine update talk. We've got a lot of stuff on social media. We're also going to do something a little bit different. Um, we've had requests over the years for a focused time for the sessions where it's just talking about social media. It's such, it's such a hot topic that... Um, that we um, uh, have decided to have a track, uh, you know, an afternoon session where it's just social media because everyone wants to go to those sessions. We're also going to do an unconference section of the workshop where we sit a couple of interesting speakers in different rooms and the topics are going to flow as the audience flows. So we're going to have Dick Morley, the infamous Dick Morley, sitting in one room. We will have um, Walt Boys and John DePietro sitting in a room ready to talk about anything to do with social media. And then the third room, the unconference room, we're actually going to vote on the topic at lunch that day, right before we go into those rooms. So it'll be a, everyone gets to participate. So I just wanted to remind everyone, registration is open. Go to marketingsalesummit.com and um, you please join us there. It's going to be an interesting year. All right. So at this point, I am going to turn, I'm going to unmute Jim and see if his technical issues are over. Jim, how are you doing over there? Well, I think I'm okay. Um, what happened was my uh, earphones cut out, but I can hear, hear the speaker, so that's good. The problem is, I th are you on speakerphone? No. Oh, it sounds like you're on speakerphone and there's an echo. Maybe it's just because I'm also speaking. Let's try this. I'm, gonna... I'm, I'm going to uh, drop off and uh, dial in and just use the phone. Okay. So, I'll be right back. Sure, go right ahead. Okay, that's right. People are still arriving, so that's not a problem. Again, let me remind everyone, on your control panel on the right, there is a little section called questions. Please type your questions in there. I'll be monitoring that and make sure that Jim gets those questions and addresses them. I've already come up with some that I want to ask him. And uh, <laughs> so uh, it should be an interesting session. All right, I am going to, let's see, Jim, are you back? Looks like he is still mid-transition. Um, for those of you who have not been to a marketing and sales summit conference before, um, it, it's an interesting mix of people. Um, we get VP level from Fortune 500 companies, director level, um, as well as a lot of product managers, communication managers, uh, sales I'm managers. There you are, Jim. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, and, and you dropped out there for a bit. But oh, it, anyway, it figures. All right, you're back. I'm going to change presenter over to you. Okay. And okay. All right, so you should have that now, Jim. Um, I'm just waiting. Not seeing anything. Sorry. Change presenter. Oh, I gotta love my charter connection, huh? I'm gonna move my screen down. There we go. Uh, okay, okay. All right, just a moment. And there. Can you uh, see my screen okay? I can see. Oh, here it comes. There we go. It's okay. in PowerPoint mode. Uh, it's in PowerPoint mode? Oh, there we go. Now it's full screen. Okay. All right. So we ready to rock and roll? Go for it. Okay. Well, thanks for your time, uh, uh, Sherry, and all the people that are on the call. I really appreciate it. Sorry for the uh, technical uh, problems, but of course, nothing ever goes bump in the night when it comes to software, right? Especially stuff over the web. So, what I'll I'll uh, be talking about today is, uh, you know, how how you can things you can do to uh, get paid more fairly for software that may be given away if uh, you're selling hardware at the same time, uh, either giving it away or uh, uh, under underpricing it. Now. There we go. Uh, just a, a couple of words uh, about myself and my firm. Uh, Software Pricing Partners uh, has been in, engaged in pricing since uh, 1987, and our specialty is uh, working with B2B companies that have some software content that they're trying to make money from. And uh, what we wind up doing is helping them by tweaking their their pricing model or helping them develop their pricing model or doing assessments that will improve their pricing model. Uh, we also get involved in uh, helping people structure and uh, make a little more consistent some of the larger deals they do. And th that uh, contributed to the work that uh, you're going to see throughout this presentation. Uh, first of all, I, th I think uh, over time, you know, the uniqueness and the value that hardware adds has been declining. Uh, people are taking it more and more for granted, uh, and the things that are more visible uh, is obviously uh, the software. Well, if the value of the hardware is declining and there's this shift you know, to uh, uh, lower value, then uh, there are a couple of things people typically do. Number one, they discount it or, or they, they lower the price to adjust for the uh, declining value. Or if they don't want to take a, uh, a revenue hit, uh, what they'll do is they'll throw in all sorts of freebies to maintain revenue, which you know just enhances the value of the package. Unfortunately, by giving away stuff for free, it doesn't do much for your profitability, uh, even though your revenues may stay up there. So the whole the whole point is that as the value shifts uh, away from hardware and it declines, uh, people do things uh, either discounting or giving stuff away, which effectively is a discount. That you know, while it may not affect their top line, it certainly doesn't help their bottom line. And I think what we've seen is is over time, uh, you know, the the software in um, many manufacturing companies. As, uh, uh, originally, it started at, as being embedded in um, some products that were hardwired and uh, really very difficult to upgrade or, or deal with. Uh, as time went on, um, you know, it became easier to program in the field, but not that easy for the customer. I mean, you were talking about, uh, you know, field programming, uh, you know, devices of one sort or another. Uh, but again, as, as time uh, went on uh, and software became uh, uh, more prevalent and the, uh, the computing devices that ran whatever controls uh, there were in the hardware 
uh, became more and more standard. The software would run on the uh, hardware. And then eventually some, some companies decided that they wanted to get into the software business. So the greatest amount of value added, uh, value add from a software perspective is when the software can be decoupled completely from the hardware. Not, not totally decoupled, but uh, it can be uh, used independent of the hardware. So what, what that means is, is that as the hardware content uh, declined in value, the software uh, content was increasing and, and uh, its value was being uh, realized by you know, more people. Unfortunately, many companies uh, wind up anchoring their software offering to the hardware, and as the hardware plunges in value, so does the software. And, and devaluing your, your software um, by offering it as a bundle with hardware is, is probably, it may be something you need to do, but it may not be the best way to realize the greatest amount of revenue from your, your software or get the greatest return on your software investment. So what I'd like to do is talk about you know, monetization and pricing and how these things relate. We'll talk about a pricing framework that we've developed over the years that uh, works with software, uh, talk about getting paid fairly, and then uh, some of the challenges and what you can do to uh, meet these challenges of monetization. Uh, first of all, uh, software monetization, you know, there, there are two types of hurdles. Uh, one comes within the company and the other comes without, outside the company. Uh, internally, uh, you, you may have uh, companies that have, uh, you know, lived off their hardware sales, so shifting into a software world is, is just per se very difficult. Uh, the other problem you can have is that, you know, hardware companies obviously have a manufacturing focus. They have systems in place that support uh, this manufacturing focus. and what do you do with software when you can't put it on the shelf, when uh, there's really no, no cost of goods? Um, and, and it's just, you know, it creates all sorts of problems for a hardware-based company. Uh, the problems, of course, are, are surmountable, but not without some effort. Uh, externally, um, what often happens is, is you have an installed base with a, a set of uh, expectations about uh, the role of software, and you've got existing relationships uh, with customers. So in general, the sales channel is reluctant to charge for things that used to be given away, uh, especially when, when customers uh, don't quite understand why they ought to start paying for something they got for free. Now, <clears throat> with that backdrop, uh, there are a number of software-specific pricing issues, uh, you know, the biggest of which is, you know, software is licensed, it's not sold, uh, you can't inventory it, uh, there's no software inventory per se, uh, there's no cost of goods, uh, it's pretty complicated stuff, it can be highly differentiated, so it's really difficult to uh, compare uh, your software against somebody else's software. Uh, it's scalable, it's configurable, uh, often the, the functionality goes very deep and uh, you, on the surface everything looks the same, but when you get into the application things are considerably different. Um, the, the other part is, you know, we, we, uh, the way software is charged for can vary all over the lot. Uh, for, for those of you with uh, some gray hair, you, re you may remember some of the hardware metrics where people would charge according to the number of MIPS or the size of the box. Um, you know, that, that is uh, one way to charge for software. You see a very common thing is, uh, you know, you price things on a per user basis. Um, you know, and if you uh, are doing online stock trading, uh, you know that you get charged on a per transaction basis. So that the same software uh, by different vendors may be charged for in different ways. Some, by, some vendor may charge by the transaction, some may charge by the seat, some may charge by counting the number of devices that are being controlled or being monitored by the application. And, and then finally what happens is software is often just uh, a part of a more complicated uh, systems sale, 
and that that creates problems uh, of itself because that system sale is always under price pressure. Well, with with all these software specific pricing issues, um, how, how do people deal with them? Well, first of all, there there are some common pricing methods, irrespective of hardware or software. Um, I think one of the most popular ones is uh, opinion, and that is, well, I think it ought to be this, I, no, I think it ought to be that. And of course, you can hear the yelling and screaming and gnashing of teeth. Uh, the other one is is practiced uh, out in the field uh, when there is either no price list or the price list is viewed as uh, for guidance, uh, not for real use, and that we call size of wallet, and that refers to uh, you know, estimating what a customer is willing to pay and then using that as a number. Uh, many companies fixate on what the competition is doing, uh, not necessarily because uh, the competition may be doing it right, uh, but because for whatever reason uh, they don't feel they can, um, you know, escape the gravitational pull of the competitor's prices. Uh, so they pay attention to competition. Uh, there's also cost base, which is real popular in uh, the hardware world, where all you do is you add up your costs, and then you apply a multiplier, and then that winds up being the uh, uh, the asking price. And then finally, uh, you know, what we advocate is is at least having your prices driven by the value you deliver. And uh, you know, I'll say more about that. But with all these pricing methods, um, they're, they're really kind of difficult to apply against software uh, because of its unique characteristics. So what I'd like to do now is talk to you about a framework that we use in our, our consulting practice that uh, may also be a framework that will be useful to you. And since pricing is such a complicated problem, one of the first things you want to do with a complicated problem is to break it into constituent parts. And what we think of is uh, there are uh, three components to a pricing model. Uh, at the lowest level is the license model. Uh, and we'll show you more about that. Um, the license model basically has, has to do with, you know, the terms and conditions and the way that you offer the product. Uh, the transaction structure has an awful lot to do with uh, how you bundle features together, uh, what sort of uh, uh, promotional discounts may be uh, added into the mix. And then finally, uh, the final step after you've uh, gone through the first two uh, exercises is uh, price setting, actually setting the price uh, not only for uh, the individual products but also for the uh, deals that may be part of this. So if, if we dive deeper into that, you'll, you'll see that each of those layers have a, a couple of elements associated with them. And now we'll talk a little more about those elements and how they fit together. Uh, at the license model level, uh, there are two components, uh, two elements. One is metric, the other are terms. Um, in terms of metric, I, I mentioned per user as an example. Um, the, the basic issue is you want to find a metric, what you charge for, where if the customer uses more of your product, i.e. consumes more of this metric, they get more value. Um, in, in fact, there is no right answer um, for w what is the right metric, but there are certainly some wrong answers, and there are some answers that, well, maybe it really doesn't matter. You know, for example, uh, if you are in uh, the CRM business um, and, you know, you think about Salesforce.com, uh, uh, they offer their software on a per-user per basis. But, uh, you know, another legitimate way of uh, charging for software uh, that helps sales guys, uh, salespeople, uh, might be charging for the number of prospects that you have in the system or, or the number of transactions that you're doing. Uh, all I'm trying to say is that the metric uh, can be anything reasonable that bears on the value you actually deliver. Uh, but, but furthermore, you really want that metric to be easy to estimate both by the customer and the sales force 
easy to control and monitor. And uh, one of the things you'd really like it to do, although it's very difficult sometimes, is to uh, not discourage use. Uh, oh my goodness, I have to buy another seat. Uh, it, it's going to cost me more money. But something that encourages you to buy more because you're getting more value. Uh, people, for example, may, may uh, complain about uh, the amount of money that they pay to Salesforce.com, uh, but uh, you know, are you really going to complain about buying another seat when you've hired another salesperson? Now, turning to the terms, what we're talking about there are really the terms of engagement, that, you know, between the customer and the company, and and you know, both sides have needs, and you want to make sure that uh, you know your needs are met as well as those of the customer. And what we're really talking about here in terms of terms, in terms of terms, good Jim, uh, has to do with the, the access to the application and the usage scenarios that that application is likely to undergo. Uh, it applies to products and services and it specifies uh, how you get paid and, uh, uh, you know, how, what you want the customer to expect to happen uh, during that uh, payment exchange. Um, and, and the terms should also uh, cover things like true-ups or product changes. Uh, and when I say true-ups, if, if uh, you know, somebody estimates their usage as being X and in fact it's Y, uh, how should they pay you for the difference uh, or what should you do if the difference is in their favor, what should you do if the difference is in your favor? And that's what I mean by true ups. The next layer uh, in our pricing model is the transaction structure. And what we're, we're talking about there are packages, uh, which are logical groupings of features. Um, you know, it also deals with if you are going to have multiple versions or editions of a product, um, how, how many and, and how are you going to articulate the differences. Um, you also want to give customers uh, enough choice to meet most of their needs, but you really don't want to give them too much choice. Uh, you, you want to give them a simple set of choices because if the choices are too complicated, often what happens is a, a customer will delay in, in making a buy or uh, may just walk away saying, throw up their hands in uh, uh, frustration and just walk away. Uh, finally, if uh, you know the packages are, are, are too complicated, uh, they can have an impact on your sales channel, uh, making it harder for for the sales channel to do business with you, and it can be very disruptive to internal systems. Uh, as far as incentives go, which are also part of the transaction, uh, you're you're really talking about discounts, and there ought to be a, a few standard types uh, that ought to encourage uh, specific customer behavior, and and you know, when you start talking about these standard incentives, um, they become easy to apply consistently and they have some limits around them. Uh, you know, for, for example, if it's a, a competitive upgrade, uh, who are the competitors that uh, you're going to give somebody a break for upgrading from? Uh, or uh, what's the time period that this promotion, when does this promotion end? And then I think finally, you know, incentives, uh, since they represent real money and uh, you're giving it away, uh, you want to use them uh, judiciously. And then finally, uh, you know, the final step is really the price setting. And unfortunately, an awful lot of people uh, try to do price setting without, you know, making sure that they're, they're building their prices on a solid foundation, the, the two layers I just mentioned before. And in price setting, you're, you're dealing not only with the amount uh, of money you're, you're going to charge somebody, uh, but also the deliverables that are going to go out the door and the money that's attached to the collection of deliverables. Uh, relative to the amount uh, that you charge, it really ought to be somehow related to value and use. And, and uh, in other words, the customer takes a look at this, uh, understands uh, how you charge for stuff, and then says, oh, I, I get it. I, I may pay you a million, but I'm making 10 or 20. Uh, when you're setting prices, uh, you want to vector in on uh, what this base price ought to be. And when I say base price, I mean it's, it's sort of the starting off price, uh, whether that's uh, you know a minimum quantity of 25 or it's a single unit really doesn't matter. 
Uh, but when I say vector in, uh, you, you want to run the numbers uh, several different ways uh, rather than just rely on, on one number. And what we found is that, you know, if you take a look at uh, coming up with a price, you know, two, three, or four different ways, uh, which we sometimes do, um, you, you wind up getting, number one, an understanding of how the numbers swing around, but more to the point, you, you wind up finding a, a band that is overlapping for all of the methods you use. Um, and that gives you a little more confidence that your price, that the price that you choose within this range that's dictated by three or four different methods is, is probably going to be reasonably right. Um, also for, for companies that are uh, dealing in international markets, it can really get confusing if you try to do pricing on a market-by-market -market basis. So what we always recommend is that you, you start with a stable, important, well-known platform, which is usually your, your domestic market. And then what you do is you parameterize the prices and adjustments uh, to reflect uh, you know, local conditions overseas. Finally, uh, in price setting, you'll, you'll have a, uh, a deal will be going down. It will consist of a whole bunch of deliverables. And what you'd really like to do is, is to have a, uh, a salesperson or whoever is constructing this uh, transaction draw from a, a Chinese menu of uh, deliverables. I mean, here we have this package. Uh, we have these types of services. Uh, we have uh, these other options, and, and these are, are pretty standard. Uh, and, you know, the way you speak about them, the way you um, identify them on a price list uh, makes them easy to understand and use. And then, uh, finally, the, the customer ought to be able to see themselves and their use pattern uh, in, you know, this collection of deliverables. And, and by the way, you know, no matter how hard you try, uh, a configuration of deliverables may not fit everybody. Uh, but what you'd really like to do is have this Chinese menu serve most of the uh, transactions that you're going to be involved in. So that, that's, uh, that's it on the, uh, the pricing framework. And, and what we're suggesting here is that if, if you go through an orderly uh, or a systematic process, uh, the results of, of setting these prices, <coughs> excuse me, uh, are likely to be uh, uh, better than if you didn't go through that process. Just a second, Jim. Um, we had one person um, ask, and I wanted to clarify, both the recording and the slides will be made available within the next couple of days. Sorry, Jim, go ahead. No, that's all right. So uh, if you go through all this effort of, um, number one, deciding that you do want to monetize your software, uh, number two, that you do want to do a reasonable job of, of pricing, uh, how do you get f paid fairly? Well, I think that the biggest challenge uh, to being paid fairly is really the company's mindset. And often what happens is companies are, are internally focused. They have this company think mindset. And one of the biggest problems in getting paid fairly by the customer is to make sure that the, the company is shifting more toward understanding what the customer's needs are and uh, being responsive to them, and but not at the company's expense. I mean, it's, it's a balancing act, and it takes a little bit of doing, but it is doable. And, and certainly, when, when a company thinks of what's fair to them, you know, they have objectives, target customers, uh, all these other characteristics, but they may, these characteristics of what a company thinks is fair may not work particularly well with customers. And, and what's happening with customers is they have this willingness to pay uh, that's based on uh, what their need is, uh, how much they know about uh, your product, competitive products, uh, how, how well they understand their need. And then there are alternatives. Uh, you know, one of the biggest alternatives that many people choose is do nothing. And, and in, far, in, in fact, the, um, the biggest competitor you often have is the uh, do nothing alternative. And, and I, I, I emphasize that 
th this customer view of FAIR is, is not an absolute thing. Uh, in the process of selling your solution, which includes software, because that's what we're talking about here, you want to make sure that you are getting the customer to have a deeper understanding not only of what your product can do, but perhaps the need that they have. And by doing so, you increase their willingness to pay. You know, if, if you drive them and, and say, look, if you don't make a move now, you will go out of business, well, that may up their willingness to, to buy something and buy it sooner rather than later. And if a customer can see that there really is significant economic benefit to buying your product, then their willingness to pay uh, may increase as well. But of course, you know, from the uh, customer's perspective, uh, what's what's fair is is often uh, determined by the it and what the it is worth. And I think you know the it is usually uh, going to give a customer better, faster, cheaper results. And what I would suggest is that you work real hard to understand what the hard dollar impact is uh, for that. And, you know, this worth, um, number one, I think when people are, are buying things, they're, they're not real, real good at figuring out absolutely how much it's worth. Rather, what they do is they go through a, a process of saying, well, what's out there and relative to whatever my benchmark is, how does this thing compare? And, and that's true for, for every product, software, hardware, uh, and, and systems, obviously. And, and I think what you, what you need to do is, is understand what, what sort of the market or the base price is for most of the features that are standard across uh, all the vendors. And then, then the real trick is your software value add, whether that's comparing software to software or uh, your software enhancing the performance of the hardware or your software just adding a value to the, the, the uh, deliverables. Uh, the, the real question is, well, what is that incremental value worth? And, and that, that value um, could be worth an awful lot of money to a select group of people, which means that you really have to understand your customer base uh, to understand who is going to value your unique features. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many companies are not very good at understanding what their unique value add is, uh, and, it gets, and the message of what makes them unique gets diluted by talking about these uh, uh, base features that are, are common across everybody and, and trying to describe how your base feature is a little better than theirs when it really doesn't matter to the customer. So my, my advice is that when you're, you're thinking about your software value add, at least start with what makes you unique in areas that nobody else has if you have them. And if, if it's really a performance thing for some standard features, uh, so be it. And, and ultimately what happens is if, if you go through uh, the, the pricing model, then, then you're in a position to, to put together what I'll call offerings. And, and these, uh, these offerings are, are, are basically, you know, products. Now, uh, these products, offerings, uh, may be ordered via the web so that they're pretty standard, easy to understand, or, or they may be very complex and uh, be part of a, a negotiated deal where, uh, you know, the, the, the list price is one thing, but how much the customer winds up paying is, is quite another. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you go through this orderly process, you're assembling the piece parts, and then you're able to put the piece parts together into some standard configurations that uh, can save you time and money in terms of selling them in the marketplace. So we've uh, talked about how to construct all these offerings, and now uh, we need to meet some of the challenges. Uh, well, first of all, uh, just as the customer's mindset in terms of willingness to pay affects their willingness to give you money, uh, the willingness to accept on the part of your company uh, also affects revenue generation because you're not going to do a deal unless somebody is willing to accept what the other party is willing to pay. Now, 
you know, it's really the mirror image of, of the customer, and that is, uh, you know, the company is, is not going to accept payment uh, unless they really understand that, you know, software has some value and, and what the implications to the company are for not, uh, you know, licensing software and getting paid uh, appropriately. Uh, and, and furthermore, you know, the, the, the company is going to be affected by the customer's mindset and the customer's willingness to pay obviously bears on this. And, and you know, the common issues you, you hear being raised are, uh, you know, well, the software doesn't cost anything, so why are you charging me for it? And, and the answer to that is because it adds value. And uh, the other part of that is, in, in effect, what you have is our engineering crew working for you, the, the developers that are in, you know, whose intellectual property is embedded in the software is indeed um, you know, value to you. We paid them, you get value from them, and we would expect to be paid. How much you get paid, that's a different issue. Um, sometimes customers look at, at uh, a software offering and saying, hey, I, I really don't need all this. And that may in fact be true if you're not, not clever about how you put your uh, bundles together, how you package your, your product. Um, customers who have said we've never paid for software before, uh, they probably need to be educated as to why you're, you know, changing what you're doing, and uh, that that speaks to things that, uh, you know, people like Sherry can help you with, um, how you position your products, uh, when what the timing is to charge for something that heretofore was uh, not being charged for, and then I think you you really do need to understand salespeople need to understand what's going to happen to budgets and staffing when all of a sudden software that used to be free now winds up being a chargeable item and there may be some other things that are associated with it. Um, you know, the sales channel is, is another mindset that you have to deal with as well. And, you know, often salespeople are, are under the belief that free software drives the hardware sale, and sometimes that's true, but that may also be true because uh, the value that the software brings to that system sale has not been articulated very well. Um, adding something that you have to, to charge for may complicate the deal somewhat, but the deal is probably complicated enough, and uh, one more element uh, doesn't matter, as long as that element is uh, easy to understand and it's uh, sort of the right size for uh, the customer usage requirement. And, and finally, uh, you know, not finally, but, you know, salespeople are certainly uh, concerned about uh, the impact of offering software uh, and, and their personal financial impact, uh, but at the same time, often they feel that uh, they need to negotiate uh, the terms of a deal, which now includes software, and they'll spend more time on the uh, in-house negotiations. And so with all of this, uh, this being said, um, we're, we're trying to make sure that you understand that the software pricing framework is something that you can apply to not only your software offering, but, but it also has some applicability to uh, non-software items. And, and what we're suggesting is that going through this, this framework in an orderly manner will get you attuned to the customer, the usage patterns, and will prepare you for uh, packaging and pricing your products uh, more appropriately. And, you know, when, when you do that, then, then all of a sudden you begin to understand how the customer's mindset, the sales channel, and all these monetization hurdles come together so that, in effect, you can uh, deal more comfortably with them, you know, and uh, be perceived as having a, a stronger customer focus, uh, being easier to do business with, uh, customers feel that they're getting treated fairly, and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, sales will come uh, faster and easier and uh, perhaps with less discounting. So that's about it. Um, uh, I, I have a question, Jim. <clears throat> sure. um, if you could go back one slide where you're showing all the different components, please. So we're, we're constantly walking this fine line in the automation markets where we're used to, for many, many years, selling hardware only, 
hardware is becoming commoditized, but it's easier to sell. In one respect, it's a faster turn, but in another respect, it's harder to differentiate. So, um, you know, where do you find that balance when you're transitioning the sales force from, you know, what we used to be doing to what really needs to be done in order to differentiate ourselves in the market? I mind, I mean, they're being pushed <clears throat> every month for, you know, when's the next sale? We've got to book it now. And if you're relying on a big complicated software component to what has become an easy hardware sell, it's pushing everything out. So aren't we just going to get a lot of pushback? Well, you will get some pushback, but I, I think you have to make it clear to the customers that, you know, buying software is part of the deal. And, and the software allows you to do things with the equipment that uh, you couldn't otherwise do. Now, w one of the things that that we've done uh, in in the past is, uh, you know, we we've and and I think it's it's more a, a negotiating uh, tactic than anything else. If the customer doesn't see value in something, well, then then take it away, and and then you'll see them scream. So so the point <laughs> is that if your your software is is allowing you to uh, exercise certain features in the hardware. Uh, that they can only access through the software. You say, well, okay, uh, you know, we're we're just not going to let you have those features. We'll we'll take the software away and then see what happens. Uh, but well, but I think that I think the point is that um, it it may slow down the sale, but you know, the the sale may also be larger. Now I think what that also says is that you've got to be very careful in doing this because. The, you, you have incentive compensation programs and you have quotas that are set based on some expectations that may no longer be true if you were trying to extract value for software. A perfect transition because Luke just asked, how would you go about revisiting and realigning outdated incentives with partners and customers and salespeople for that matter? Okay, I'll play your game. How, how would you do it? <laughs> I mean, you do it. I, I mean, I... I I, I think change is very difficult, and you want to think about it carefully. Change that includes the, the money change in a person's wallet or pocket is even more difficult to think through. And I think it, it requires an awful lot of training. It requires a lot of hand-holding. I, I think you don't want to do this in a big bang. You want to engage the parties that have to think about this. Uh, you want to build coalitions. I mean, it, in, in some respects, it's a, it's a lot like a, a political campaign and, and uh, you know, getting your law enacted and your law being a, a change in attitude. It, it is not easy. Well, and it, it goes back to what you were saying before, um, you know, if the um, uh, salesperson is complaining, this is more complicated, takes longer, you can do what you suggested for the customer, take that value component out, and now all of a sudden he's selling a commodity, he's not going to be happy about that either. So it, he really needs to understand, he, she needs to understand that the software is really where the differentiation and the added value and the increased commission in their pocket is coming from. No, that, that's right. And, and I think uh, while you have to educate the, the, uh, the sales force, I think you need to educate other uh, parts of the engineering community within in the company because I think uh, whatever we produce, whether it's hardware or software, is viewed very much as uh, my my own baby, and my baby is really attractive, and uh, <laughs> everybody will want to. I have to shift gears because nobody buys babies anymore. Um, <laughs> well, they do, but not not in polite company. Um, and 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 the point the the point is that um, you know hardware engineers who may have the the the, uh, the loudest <coughs> voice at the table. Um, you know, they have to understand that, in effect, software can enhance their offerings as opposed to um, uh, limit the value that, that people see. Here's a good strategy question. What are the pros and cons of listing software prices publicly on a website and vice versa, not listing prices but using request a quote? This came from Charles. Yeah. Well, I, I really think it... it, it 
depends on what your what your strategy is. I, I mean, listing listing prices on a website, uh, you know, thirty nine ninety nine or forty nine ninety nine, whatever. I, I think I think of as being associated with um, fast turnaround, high volume transactions. Uh, on on the other hand, uh, call for quote. If it really ought to be an off-the-shelf item, I mean, I I, I find that uh, a real pain in the neck. But I think if if you know it really require if your transaction really requires a lot of understanding what the customer situation is, uh, selecting from a fairly complicated um, price book to construct a quote, uh, then then I think um, you you don't. You don't list the the prices on on your website. However, having said that, um, it turns out prices are really important at two stages. The first stage is for sizing, you know, just to make sure that you're in the ballpark, my budget ballpark. And the other one is is when we get down to the short strokes, and uh, you know, I may be one of a handful of uh, of competitors, and and price really does matter at that point. Um, as far as the sizing goes, it's it's fair game to say that you may want to paint some scenarios. Uh, you know, plants of a uh, thousand employees. You know, the the price per employee may range between X and Y, or uh, the total value of the uh, transaction could be, you know, a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars. I, I think what you're you're trying to do is you're trying to convey an idea of what the price is, even when you don't want to list the specific price of the piece part. Is that helpful? You may tell me I'm a little, <clears throat> you, you feel free to tell me I'm crazy here, but my rule of thumb has always been if it's a commodity type product, hardware or software, you know, if everyone's selling the same HMI software package, everyone's selling, um, you know, a, a certain kind of level sensor, um, if it's mm -hmm. already into the commodity range, then what I tell my clients is um, list a starting at like you said earlier, baseline price, and then yeah. that leaves that gets you into the ballpark, but leaves you room to then negotiate value add. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a, that's a a bad idea, but what I found is that people are more sensitive to how much money they're going to spend in the transaction than how much a particular component of the transaction is going to cost. Now, if it turns out that uh, your your transactions consist of, you know, buying you know a lot of commodity type stuff. I'm I'm with you. Um, on, on the other hand, if those commodity type things are wrapped into a more complex configuration, then I think you you need a, a different strategy, one that speaks to the size of the transaction as opposed to the piece part price. Um, I don't know what others here in, in the conference call think, but um, in the industrial automation space, I, I think, unfortunately, we see both. We see mm -hmm. them, you know, pinch pennies on individual piece prices and then look at the total transaction price and, and you know, and go, oh, woe is me over that as well. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that that's a, a very uh, common, uh, common thing. I mean, the... the you know, it, it's not unusual for the financial gatekeepers, whoever they may be, to uh, say, okay, how much for the deal? And then you say, it's a million dollars. And they say, well, how did you get to that? And then all of a sudden they want a line item breakdown. And then they, they dive into the line item. They say, well, how come this is 100000 exactly. in consulting services? Well, it's because you're charging this much per hour times these many hours. Why do you need so many hours? And then they put the deal back together again. They say it's still too much. So uh, you, know, you, you can't please everybody, but uh, you, you do the best you can. And I, and I think, quite frankly, all this, this whole presentation is geared about is doing a little better than you're now doing in terms of generating money from your software. Yeah, and it really all comes down to value add. If you have to be able to demonstrate it, show it, all that good stuff. Um, I have a, a question for you. Um, how do you, you know, we're talking about monetizing software here throughout this this whole presentation. So, how do you get management's attention that it's worth trying, worth spending time to monetize the software? I still see a lot of um, companies within the automation space fighting that. Well, I, I think they're they're going to continue to fight it, and uh, uh, you know, 
so, you know, sometimes even when you whack a mule on, on the side <laughs> of the head with a two by four, you can't get their attention. Uh, so I, I think, you know, one of the, the ways, uh, I mean, management seems to be persuaded by either the amount of money that the company will make and therefore how much management can pay themselves. Uh, I know that's a, a crass way of looking at it, but it seems to be true with the free hand of the market. Um, but the, the the point is that you may be able to build a case uh, based on what competition is doing or, or based on uh, customer research as to what people would be willing to pay or you know your competitors have indeed extracted and and this represents revenue that you're uh, you're not tapping into it, it isn't that you've left it on the table it's that you haven't even figured out that you ought to bring it to the table and whether you leave it there or not is a different matter um so i think uh, you know there's only so much you can do in encouraging management to uh realize these revenue sources and and frankly if the numbers aren't big enough uh, chances are management uh, will have other fish to fry uh, and the real trick is to a yourself know that these numbers are worth going after and uh, b having the data to back that up and then as I say you know building coalitions inside the company to uh, you know make sure that uh, you, you get a fair hearing by management who ultimately will will do what uh, they feel needs to be done irrespective of somebody saying hey look at all this money you could make from software well you know some people listen some people don't I have a new way to make money let's create a whack a manager video game <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Uh, okay, so what if you have no control, though? So, you know, you're you're in charge of a business unit. There's so much consolidation going on in this industry um, that it's hard to keep track of who owns who. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of business units that have now been incorporated into bigger entities. What if they don't have control, though? Management wants the unit to make more money, but, but there's a software component, a fairly hefty one, that's being given away. What can a, a business unit manager do well in in a case like that um, I, I guess one one of the ways to, to look at at this is it's really a two-step process the business units produce stuff and the and the sales organization sells stuff and the 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 discounting or or the giveaways or the concessions are done by the sales force um, and that's irrespective of what the business units who produce this stuff um, you know, do. So one of the things I, I might be inclined to do is, is to take a look at unit shipments uh, in, in terms of uh, the amount of software that went out my door into the hands of the sales force. And I would say, you know, given these volumes, these are the prices that we would normally realize. So if I ship a thousand units at a buck a piece, I'd see a thousand dollars. It, you know, if, if I were going out to the market on my own. But in the sales organization who has, ta who has taken these thousand pieces that have a nominal price of a buck and they decide to give it away, that, that's okay. That, that's their decision. But I've done my job as a business unit manager in producing these things. Now, that decoupling can be very useful, especially if you, you have... Um, struggles for who's going to get the revenue credit on a deal that has been discounted. And, and often what happens is the hardware guys will, will want to get the bulk of the, uh, the, the revenue credit and the, the software guys won't want to take the hit and so you have this internal wrangling that goes on. And one of the ways to at least bring that to rest is to say, look, here is the value at our current list standard prices that we would have realized here is the amount of money that we actually took to the bank and it's that difference that management has to deal with now if you have incentive programs that are based on your revenue contribution not on the amount of output you have done you have a problem and then I think what you have to do is make sure that the incentives for the business unit managers line up with the way you want the business unit people to uh, behave and the incentives for the sales organization are lined up the way you want the sales organization to be 
to behave. But sometimes people use the same incentive systems and they just don't work. There's some interesting parallels we could draw between um, the software issue and the customization issue. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about um, friends I know who are selling standard pieces of equipment or standard systems versus those who are doing the more complex customized cells um, and management is whining at the people doing the custom system saying you've got to sell more faster when they're saying but wait it's a more complex sale the end result is a much larger sale but you got to wait for it and and it's amazing how impatient people can get um, that was perfect timing. Thank you, Jim. Do you want to wrap up sentence or two, and then I'll announce the next webinar? Uh, sure. I just want to say that uh, I'm going to be doing a workshop at the uh, Professional Pricing Society on uh, how manufacturing companies can monetize software IT, and it'll get into much more depth about how you actually use this uh, pricing model framework to uh, set prices. And uh, if anyone... Uh, has any questions uh, or you know wants to explore anything that we've talked about up to now uh, there's my contact information and uh, you may also want to take a look at that uh, that workshop that's available as well and we'll post these slides online we'll put them up on the uh, blog right away and send that link out to everyone the next webinar is Walt Boys who is going to bringing be bringing back his very popular public relations 101 um, seminar that he gave down at the first marketing and sales summit um, uh, down in well I don't forget what city it was that was years ago and he'll be doing that on April 4th at noon Eastern everyone will be getting notice is about that. So PR 101, uh, April 4th. Thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate the time. And um, maybe I'll see if I can uh, wrangle a, a, a blog post out of you on, on this topic in a little more detail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. everyone. And thank you again for uh, your time and uh, everyone's time uh, that's on the uh, call right now. Awesome. Thank you. Lots of thank yous coming in through the questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.